evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I am so thankful and excited to be sitting here with Elizabeth James Perry again. Um, we had one conversation specifically about her exhibit, which you can see on the museum's YouTube page. Tonight should be more of an open discussion. So um, Sophia, uh, who is just now joining us, she was having a little trouble logging on, um, but she's with us now. Uh, Sophia Pont, one of our museum apprentices, will be joining us for this discussion, and Elizabeth, of course. Um, I want to thank all of you for attending. I also want to extend thanks to Mass Humanities for their partial funding of this discussion. And again, this is meant to be an open discussion. So once I do the intros and Elizabeth and Sophia start speaking, I'm hoping to speak very little this evening. I will monitor the chats so that as topics arise or you have questions, I will relay those to Sophia and Elizabeth. And so I'm going to do brief introductions of the both of them, um, and then I will let them take the discussion, uh, take the discussion over. So Sophia is one of our museum apprentices. She has been integral in our Common Ground storytelling project. She's been a participant uh, in that project where we are seeking to tell Greater, where we're seeking to put together a picture of the greater New Bedford area through storytelling. Um, Elizabeth's exhibit is part of that, but is so much more. Um, Elizabeth's exhibition, if you haven't seen it, you've got to get to the museum to see it. Because Elizabeth, uh, in, in her exhibition, which is uh, composed of these beautiful wampum pieces, it's about uh, indigenous art, and Wampanoag history and Wampanoag culture and the environment. And it all comes together as one um, wonderful story, which I'm sure you'll hear a, a lot about tonight. Um, but before we get going, Sophia, will you please just tell attendees a little bit about yourself and why you're participating tonight? And then um, I'll let Elizabeth take over and uh, the, the discussion will begin. Okay, well, Hi, I'm Sophia, as you might have known already. Um, I'm a third year apprentice uh, at, at the Whaling Museum. So um, I've had a really great opportunity with um, Akia and, the, and my, my boss, um, Phoebe McGee, to uh, participate in the Common Ground Project, where I talked a lot. Um, I made a video about my life and um, my parents' lives and how we came to New Bedford and what it's like being um, a white Hispanic because I am Panamanian, my mother is Panamanian. And we talked about um, just little little cultural things that we've kept with us. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> Didn't realize I was muted. <laughs> I said, thank you for participating tonight, Phoebe. It's great to have you with us. Nice to meet you virtually. So Elizabeth James Perry is so many things. She's an artist, she's a historian, um, she's an environmental scientist, she's a marine scientist, she's a culture keeper. Um, she comes from a long line of Wampanoag women artists. Um, and so I will let Elizabeth introduce herself um, with all of the, I mean, we could be here all night. We could do a once a week uh, presentation with Elizabeth talking about different things and then people never get bored with it. Um, but I'm gonna stop there, Elizabeth, and let you take over. And just after you're done introducing yourself, if you could maybe start us off um, with a discussion on you know, how you feel about Greater New Bedford and New Bedford and your history here. Um, and then, you know, Sophie, I know you have some questions about the exhibition and some of Elizabeth's pieces. And please, attendees, do send me your questions or comments through chat, and I will forward them to Elizabeth and Sophia throughout this presentation. I had um, prepared a, a short PowerPoint, and I thought it might help the discussion a little bit because it kind of ties in diverse areas of my background and some of the artistic work and research that I do as well. So I'm just going to go to screen sharing and see if I can pull it up. There. 
Um, so, Monique Isak, everybody. Uh, my name is Elizabeth James Perry. I'm an enrolled member of the Aquino Wampanoag tribe. And my family has been sort of going back and forth in, uh, often for many, many generations. And then within the past, I would say four generations, it became a little bit more common to spend, you know, the first half of your life at Gay Head and Aquina on Martha's Vineyard, and then the second half or more, you know, two thirds of your life really on the mainland in, in New Bedford. Um, some folks were spending a lot of time in New Bedford. Uh, others were kind of here sometimes, but off on whaling voyages where they were away from home for literally years at a time. Uh, my, the last per people in my family that were career whalemen were Henry Gray James the first. That's my great grandfather. Um, he died on the young side. Uh, he had two sons and one is, was my grandfather, Henry Gray James II, who was a pharmacist. Um, and the other whalemen uh, in my family that also died in um, just a few years later, essentially, well, a few decades, couple decades later in the New Bedford area was Joseph Blaine. And he was a career whaleman. He had a longer life. You know, he had a chance to travel repeatedly to the Arctic. He had some adventures and misadventures there. And um, so it's their stories that have really helped to fuel some of my passion for whaling era history. And, you know, it was always helped by the material culture that we had in our households. So many Native families um, had, and still some of them still have, uh, you know, things made of whalebone, things made of whalebone, uh, baleen, um, you know, rolling pins. I've asked Akia at times about things in the Whaling Museum collection, looking to see if tribal members have made donations or, you know, sold part of their collections to, to the museum. And I also look at other institutions for, um, you know, our material, culture, and arts as well. Um, I think, you know, following the whaling days, folks were, you um, probably diver equally diverse as during the whaling days, except without the whaling. So there was still a lot of fishing. Some Wampanoag families actually co-owned fishing vessels, the Cooks and I, I wanna say the Francis mm -hmm. family, um, maybe the Cooks, and I'm forgetting the other surnames. Um, my cousin Hope Horgan told me about it um, because she heard about it from her grandmother. Uh, and so there's just these interesting connections, interesting industries people went into um, or continued in, I guess I would say. There were basket makers and some of my work today reflects the, those aesthetics, those traditional materials like the corn husk and the splint basketry, soft fiber weaving, like this is a Thunderbird design on um, a yarn bag. It's a really distinct um, type of weaving called oblique weaving. The corn husk bag is um, featuring twining. So it's, a, it's kind of a double weave that allows you to turn whatever color if you're creating patterns to the, to the front surface. So distinctive arts. Lots of folks also raised their own food and had, you know, from time immemorial, right? Lots of native horticulture, wild harvesting of um, foods and medicines and um, really delicious herbal teas and things like, you know, made from sassafras and um, other roots that were really delicious and also considered a really important spring tonic, for example. Important trade things, you know, um, herbal doctors made their living uh, treating native people, but then also in those days, there really weren't hospitals and things, you know, uh, it's very different from nowadays where I have like half a dozen medical establishments, you know, with tons of offices and nurses and I can make an appointment easily. It wasn't like that, you know, 100 years ago or 150 years ago. Um, so Indian doctors actually made a really good living. You know, they knew their medicines really well. Um, many of them, because they stayed in the same area or worked the same circuit, knew their patients sometimes from before their birth. Um, and so you can look at maps and community um, memories uh, for evidence of people like Charlotte White or Dr. William Perry. Um, there's other ones that are a little bit less, you know, discussed, I think, in current times, but you can still find them mentioned in the various censuses because they mention what they're doing. Um, this is a, an example of oblique weaving. So this is like the Thunderbird bird bag I just shared with you all, but it's much older uh, and not made by me. Um, it's really, really handsome. It's made of buffalo wool. So this is our one of our indigenous soft fiber materials for spinning. Um, th this is strung with glass trade beads, similar to the bag that I just showed you. 
the design here is really beautiful and eloquent. And I think in times like these where we're we're going through a lot, society is coming to terms, hopefully, um, with a lot of things that need to be addressed in terms of equality and respect and um, creating a sustainable lifestyle for us all. You know, I think we have to work hard to make sure that the outcomes are what we all need to continue to live well. But I like this bag because of its theme of all of these human beings connected in one long chain. Um, I think it just is, um, it speaks eloquently about the human connection and the importance of making those connections. And my art is one of the ways that I make some of those connections. Mm -hmm. The natural materials we use also helps to tie our arts to the environment. And that's another um, central theme of my work is concern over ocean quality, but also quality of the land. Um, coming from generations of folks who've lived in New Bedford, I grew up in Dartmouth, which is essentially Literally, not essentially, it's literally up the street. <laughs> That's what I, where I am right now in my home. Um, you know, listening to my parents and my grandparents talk about New Bedford, there's a lot of change. You know, my mom talked about camping in woods in New Bedford. There's no woods that you could get together with your friends and do that now. I mean, I, I haven't seen them. I don't know where they're hiding, if they still exist. My grandfather would get sassafras root for his homemade root beer in New Bedford. I got to admit, uh, you know, cities don't strike me as the cleanest places. Um, I'm not sure if I saw sassafras in New Bedford now, I would pick it because I would be really worried about toxins and pollutants. Um, but, you know, it gives you an idea that it was in at least in some areas, just less densely built up, less covered with concrete, maybe it breathed a little more in a lot of ways um, and supported other types of life than just humans and vehicles. Um, so I think, you know, that richness helped people to feel a little bit more at home, you know, coming from an island community, especially up at Aquina, it just was not a densely populated place. Um, people had you know, lands around their homes. They had apple orchards that they planted, blueberry, you know, strand, stands of blueberry bushes. There are gardens where they were growing corn beans and squash, but then also they were growing, you know, um, introduced things like potatoes, um, tomatoes, whatever, maybe not tomatoes. I don't see those a lot in the records. They were growing other things though. Um, yeah, so I think moving from the island into a city, there's just a lot more of a uh, much higher population, much higher density. And so I think it's interesting my grandfather living in New Bedford held on to that tradition of making herbal teas and traditional um, drinks that became sodas essentially. But you know, our version was a little healthier than what you're buying in the stores now. This is um, an example of a site that I visited. We have a, a question and I just wanted to ask it before you uh, move along oh, to a new slide. Um, one of the attendees wants to know where where this beautiful scene is. Yeah, so it's it's right, it's a mixed blessing, right? So there were tons of turtles here and some really beautiful wa beautiful water lilies, which is a sign that the water quality is definitely coming back. But there's a sadness too, because the story behind this site is it's behind some cranberry bogs that were developed in the as commercial cranberry bogs. You know, there may have been natural cranberry bogs mm -hmm. there, but it's changed on it was treated, chemically treated for a while. The background of some of these huge bogs that we have in New England, which don't get me wrong, they produce a lot of wonderful cranberries, but you know, they, they take their toll, um, is that many of them were cedar swamps. So when you look at my art, the, the strap of that bag that you saw, the corn husk bag, that was made from cedar bark, which is really actually for me to get now. It's just not as common. So these are the, this is kind of a cedar graveyard. So at the back of this property, all of these cedars had been cut down probably more than 100 years ago by whatever company had this land. However, they never got to develop this. They just simply left the stumps and worked the front part of the property. Well, the property, I think this is in Freetown or Lakeville, was given over um, within the past few years, I think, to maybe DCR, Department of Conservation and Recreation. Um, the, the reason I was there is I was monitoring some archaeology. They were trying to do restorative plantings. Um, there were areas where the trucks had really compressed the soils. There, were, there wasn't much topsoil left because the soil had been pushed around, um, et cetera. 
And so, yeah, this was an interesting site. There were some beautiful scenes. There were scenes that made you kind of wonder like, oh, gee, I wonder what it was like originally. Um, but then also I think because seeing all those turtles, I kind of thought, well, it can't be that bad. You know, look at all this life. Um, so maybe it'll come back eventually. So yeah, I hope that helps you. I'm sure if you contacted DCR, they could give you the exact location. I went to so many places, I just didn't keep, keep a tally on the addresses, so. <laughs> um, the cedar bark is also really important uh, for traditional architecture. So the whole wooden frames that we would tie together to make our home frames were all lashed in cedar bark and um, cedar bark rope and braid. And then the poles themselves were also young cedar trees. They had a lot of flexibility and natural spring and they kept that even long after they were essentially dry, you know, an older frame. So they had a lot of spring. So back when, you know, you might expect to get feet and feet of snow every winter, it wouldn't crush your house. Your house would might kind of shift under weight or wind, but it would spring back. And so, you know, your house, you build it well, it's gonna last two, three decades at least. You might have to do a few repairs, but it's really strong. So it's, um, it's in limited supply now. So we're pretty careful about where and when we build the houses because there's no sense in killing trees, um, you know, if, if it's, it's not needed. Um, so this is a, an interesting um, way to approach history, I think, for me and culture, abolitionist history. So I, you know, in the past, I've written about the Boston family, um, Captain Absalom Boston, his wife, Hannah Cook. Um, Hannah Cook was actually a Dartmouth Indian, um, and she was from the Cook and Almy families. And there's a bunch of other families that, that um, you know, her siblings married into. Many of them moved to Boston, uh, to, uh, excuse me, many of them moved to New Bedford. I knew I was gonna get that wrong. Um, but this is where I was looking at some Dartmouth area maps near Paden Arum. Um, and I, it started when I was monitoring archeology span again. It was an interesting site. The location was kind of interesting. Didn't have a lot of, of knowledge of that particular spot. It's not far from here. I had worked actually next door. But um, after I monitored, I was curious about who exactly lived there. And I found this map and there is Mrs. Boston. If you look at, there's sort of this fork of roads and it says Casno and then Reed and then just in behind Reed is Mrs. Boston. And that correlates to where I was monitoring. It was sort of set back from the road. Um, and I think earlier, you can see there's an Almy next door, um, which could very well be an aunt or an uncle or a cousin. Um, I think earlier maps show other folks too. There's Mashau. Anybody, anybody who knows, you know, Dartmouth, New Bedford history would kind of recognize some of those names from shipbuilding and whaling and trading and things like that. Um, some abolitionist work, all of that. Um, and an Indian land case actually that had to do with lands on the west side of the Slocum River and some lands in Westport. The Wainer family was also involved in that. So if you study Cuff history, that name will come up quite a bit. So this was an, an interesting example of um, being able to tie exact spots on the land to some of the folks that you hear about. You know, if you're walking through New Bedford and looking at exhibits and I don't know if Captain Absalom Boston is mentioned or not, to be honest with you, many abolitionists are. Um, so, you know, this would be an example of knowing where his wife's family and her connections um, were centered in. Some of my work also is, as I indicated before, going into collections. And um, Akia had mentioned that I was looking for gay head baskets because they're very distinctive. And I'm sharing a photo from the Co Foundation, which is in the Southwest. And um, they had a couple of examples of gay head basketry. I don't think they're by the same person. If you are, you know, interested in really scrutinizing the designs, they're a little bit different. And different tools were actually made to execute the designs, but stylistically they're very consistent with, you know, gay head scroll work and poker work. Um, this is a nice, maybe hickory splint basket. The splints are kind of thick to be able to be treated this way and not damage the splints. Um, so this isn't a delicate basket. It's small, it could have been intended as decorative, but on the other hand, it's sturdy enough to use. And um, this would be 19th century, I actually, didn't grow up with anybody doing this exact work. My mom did scrimshaw, so I'm familiar with that etching. Um, and my brother is a really good wood carver. Um, and some folks do basketry, twined and splint. 
I don't know anyone who's doing this. I'd like actually to devote some time to kind of reviving the art. It's really intriguing to me and really distinctive. And I think there's a lot of importance to keeping traditions alive. This is another map, um, uh, you know, the cuffs come up so often in New Bedford, Dartmouth area, Westport area history. And um, I was actually researching Dr. William Perry, who is one of the Indian doctors that I mentioned. He was um, alive in the 19th century. You can you know, read about him online and all. Um, and this is a neighborhood in what was called Indian Town, which was on Watapa Pond. Um, so a little bit west of where we are. And um, in the 19th century, you can see Dr. William Perry's house is noted you know, right up from the split. And then just down from there is Ruth Cuff. And so Ruth Cuff was actually a medicine woman. Um, I believe she signed off some documents, Ruth Cuff, Indian doctress. Uh, so you know what her profession was. She had a nice long life. Um, so this is probably like heading into mid 1800s, 1850-ish, if I had to guess, maybe a little bit later, but I don't think so. Cause I think, I suspect she passed away around that time. Um, you see the crank name, uh, you know, Hannah Crank uh, was another medicine person, um, same neighborhood. They were living in, you know, that land is so beautiful. Um, that was a reservation. And unfortunately, it was taken by the state in 1905. There was a petition to remove the Indians from the land. And um, it was for, to make that a reservoir and also for economic reasons. Uh, um, you know, folks that had a beer brewery wanted clean water and I suppose they, thought native claim to land would perhaps interfere with that. And so it's not a, a reservation anymore. The Perry family, other families were moved um, and they had to go and you know rent apartments in Fall River or whatever. So you see the cuffs, some of the cuffs are in Fall River after that or along with that, that time. Um, some of the Perrys were as well. There were Perrys in Dartmouth and um, I actually might be on uh, a Perry farm that was actually connected to those Perrys. I still have to verify it, um, but it's a, it's a small world um, and uh, yeah, interesting times. So Ruth Cuff was one of the siblings of Jonathan Cuff, who was my direct ancestor who married Hepzibah Akuch on Martha's Vineyard. Um, so he lived, Jonathan lived a lot on the vineyard um, in Aquina and in Chilmark as well, or what's now Chilmark. And um, he traveled a lot and he fished a lot and so, you know, it's interesting to think of that, but there were Wampanoags who were salvage divers in the Caribbean, you know, circa 1700. Then they come back. And then there were um, folks who were fishing. They were fishing around here. They were also fishing off the coast of Maine. They were fishing off the coast of Nova Scotia. They were off Greenland, um, fishing different things, you know, in different vessels. Some of them got taken captive by pirates. You can read about a Jonathan Mumford, who <laughs> was captured, you probably know this story because he, he was freed in Newport. The pirates were hung. Um, this, that was like, you know, circa 1705 or something, I think. Um, so people were traveling. There was this interesting element of, you know, having really strong ties to tribal community, tribal lands. You know, there's the neighborhood that I think was a reservation that I just showed you where Mrs. Boston lived. That's a bit late, you know, 1850, 1850s late here. It's really only 50 years later that this isn't Indian land anymore. Um, the, the, the Dartmouth land, there was a land case um, involving some of the land. I'm not sure if that was exactly the spot. There, they referenced several spots. That case was brought to the courts in, you know, the 1860s. Um, so they were referencing land that was gradually being encroached upon or maybe not so gradually being encroached upon in that, that case from like 1800 on, or maybe a little bit later. Um, so it gives you perspective of, there was a lot of room. There was a lot of space. There was room to have reservations. There was room to wild harvest enough herbs that multiple medicine people could make their living um, selling herbal tinctures and teas and things like that, ointments, um, treating pneumonia and heart ailments, you know, Charlotte White, I think was one of those people. Um, so people had their specialties. So yeah, I just wanted to share that quickly. I don't have uh, any Dr. Perry New Bedford stories per se, 
but he wasn't far away. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if one didn't pop up someday with enough research. I'm gonna switch over to showing a couple of pieces from the art exhibit. Um, so Sophia, I didn't know if you had specific questions that you wanted me to field or, um, but I thought I'd start with the Thunderbird belt. Okay, uh, I actually did have some questions. Um, starting with belts like these, I know that you talked to Dr. Akia about the process of making them and how you don't really measure time while you make them, but I wanted to know um, if you could go more in depth to what the process was like. Sure. Yes. Um, so it starts with the ocean and getting the shells. Um, the shells that we use for wampum are all ocean clams. They're pretty thick and substantial and um, you can't really start with really thin shells to get sizable thick beads once you take the back off. So I have to start by getting the biggest shells that I can um, as long as the water's clean uh, or get another family member to dig them, get a family member on the vineyard to dig them or you know just get them from fishermen. Depends on what I'm doing at the time, how busy I am um, and you know if it's cold I'm not interested in going out there and freezing. So yeah, anyway, um, I sort my shells by size and I cut out my, cut out rough beads and then I start shaping them. And they're still kind of rough at that point. Then I drill them. If I wanna do it all traditional, which takes a lot of time, I use a pump drill. Um, there's, I did a video recently for Mass Cultural Council that um, you know I have a, a long relationship with them. They funded a fellowship um, in 2014 uh, for my wampum and my textiles. And um, they've been really supportive. And so I worked with them on a video um, about the art. And I thought it was a nice way for me to share with, especially with tribal members who, you know, didn't live right here and couldn't visit with me or whatever. Um, you know, I've got relatives in New Zealand. I've got relatives all over the place. And so uh, it was a nice way to reach them. Uh, but a lot of other folks enjoyed it too. The pump drilling, it takes a while. Electric drilling still takes a while. It's a thick bead. You have a lot of physical material that you have to drill down through, but it's a shell. So you don't want to put an undue amount of pressure. You don't want to break your drill. You don't want to break the shell or chip the shell. Um, it's just not, it's not something that you can super, it's not like working with stone or concrete um, that might be a little tougher or forgiving or something. It's shell. Um, so you kind of have to gauge it. It can take you, Maybe from start to finish, not that I do one at a time because I tend to produce some and then take a break and then work on some more. Um, so I'll, I'll cut out, you know, maybe I'll rough cut 10 beads or 20 beads, depending on what the day is. They might all just be the same color if I've sorted my shells that way. Um, and I know what the proportions are of the beads that I need for whatever it is if I'm making earrings or a nice collar or a bigger belt, you know. 300 beads or something, you sort of have to plan. You wouldn't wanna have you know, an agreement with a museum, for instance, to make a belt and work on it the day before. 300 beads, an hour, at least an hour per bead, just making them. Um, yeah, that's, it's a commitment, it really is. And uh, when you've made your beads, you kind of wanna make more than you need because there's gonna be some that are thin. Some of them are just gonna break no matter how careful you are in the process. So you're gonna to have to discard those. Some of them might, the color might be off. It might not be a pure white and maybe you don't want it to be modeled. And maybe you want more darker purple beads and less kind of striped, um, you know, mosaic looking purple beads. So then you sort those out and then you realize, oh, I'm gonna need some darker purple beads. So I'm gonna go back out and make some more. Then I'm gonna come in start laying out my project. So I kind of lay out my beads and I eyeball everything to make sure I like how the proportions work. Does the design feel good? Does it feel unfinished? Um, does it feel inappropriate? You know, um, I'm pretty sensitive to what I'm doing. And if something doesn't feel great, then I think, oh, you know, it's just not a good day for it. I'm gonna put these away, wait till it's a better day and think about the design a little bit more and the purpose and then work on it again. 
So the design is a Thunderbird design. Um, and those come out of our traditional beliefs here in the broader Northeastern woodlands, um, shared traditions, we really up into Canada and all um, about sky beings and earth beings and water beings and all that um, show themselves on our wampum. And, you know, like the bag that I showed you that I made had a Thunderbird design. Um, you might see ocean beings, you might see a water panther, which com comes out of our sort of complementary Thunderbird um, ocean panther uh, symbology. And so those are just some of the things that might come up. Uh, I also had oh, another question. Sorry, oh, sorry. Sorry. Nope, I was actually going to bring up another question you had, but you were probably about to ask the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, it was just now that you said um, um, about the Thunderbird and the Water Panther, uh, I had a question about. Um, so in your tribe or you specifically, when you make a piece of art um, for because you know some of your pieces say that they're dedicated to the water panther or they're dedicated to these different spirits that you um maybe we can't necessarily see or they're not physically present in our lives um if you m make it dedicated to them what do you do with them when you're finished i mean because you can't really give it to them so ah well i don't know what, you know, can we say anything definitive in that way? Because um, I think the thing about spirituality is that there's also some mystery. I think if you come from native culture, invariably there's also humor, sometimes at one's own expense that works into, especially with um, little people stories and things like that. Uh, so there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to the world that isn't simply, you know, making baskets, growing food, going fishing or doing some whaling, um, but it's involved in all of those things, right? And so if you associate some of those beings with, you know, behind the incredible beauty of Cranberry Day Harvest, um, so you take the time to pay your respects a small way, saying some words, whatever, making sure you don't pick everything so you're not being greedy. So there's room for other people and all the animals and birds to get their fill too, because this region supports a lot of life and not just ours. Um, so it's a way of, having room in your life for other things, other beings. Um, it's a way of being respectful. It's a way of maybe having um, a little spirit of, of reciprocity, not over harvesting and overusing it because it's just like, well, we own all of this, so we can waste it all if we want to. We don't really have that in our belief system. So it, those are all things that, um, are in our belief system that remind us to be respectful. They remind us to plan for the next generations. Um, it's not just us being poetic when we say, thinking about the next seven generations. It's really a way of life. You really wanna manage your resources so that you haven't used things up, so that you've managed the land well, so it's still producing. So your grandkids should have at least as not, if not more than what you have. We're out of balance. We don't even own the tiny reservations in most cases that we used to. We, we currently have Aquina and Mashpee, um, but there was lots of land at Herring Pond. There was land at Potanamakit where, where Ruth Moses was from. Um, there, there was land at Indian Town in Watapa. Um, so our natural resources that we have as a nation, even though our nations are growing, they're essentially shrinking. That's disturbing. Um, but it's still our homeland and even not necessarily making most of the decisions in this place. We have these strong ties for thousands of years. Um, those ties aren't gonna go away. Um, caring doesn't go away. The responsibility of being a careful steward doesn't go away. Connections to spiritual things on the land that would be hard to explain to someone outside of the culture that you know don't even have the names or the words or the beings or the stories or any exposure because I mean if you're like a northeastern native people it's almost person it's like not existing in a lot of ways um, you really 
I'm not really acknowledged in terms of any of the, the art that I see more broadly in the, the region or in Massachusetts. My family isn't, I mean, I've got the one famous guy <laughs> that people talk about, but I'm always like, wow, Ruth gets no credit. Oh my gosh, how hard must she have worked? Uh, you know, Paul Cuffey the second's wife, there's some mentions of her because she wrote some letters or, or, you know, was mentioned in letters. And I just think, wow, uh, you know, that, that's rugged. <laughs> um, from my perspective as a Wampanoag person, like women should be at least equal acknowledged to men um, because we're life givers and everything comes from us. And the earth is considered a feminine entity and everything comes up out of the earth too. And so it's, it's uh, you know, it's sort of different to kind of convey our values to the outside world because uh, yeah, I'm just not sure, you know, what kind of, speaking of common ground, it's just hard to know what people are gonna be able to grasp. Um, you know, not that someone has to have my belief, exact religious beliefs, but if there's a little bit of knowledge and respect and accommodation, it's much easier to do what you need to do to take care of yourself, um, to take care of your family, to do ceremony to take care of the earth, um, then if there's no knowledge and someone's just gonna like, you know, interfere with something or be rude or obnoxious or disrespectful or something like that. It's, it's just a lot, it's a lot to balance. Um, so in terms of what happens to my art, I took a long time to answer your question. Yeah, so for me, it's the thinking and hopefully, so I'm an artist, I can be a little scattered. Hopefully it's also the stage of making, it should be, um, that's my gift. And I put it out there and hopefully many aspects of creation can see it and appreciate it and get what they're going to, you know, what kind of nourishment they're gonna take from it. If it's a visual treat, if it's spiritually nourishing, if it's acknowledging some loss, you know, in, in some, you know, particularly sad part of history or, or family history or personal history or whatever it was. There's just different things for, you know, different experiences. Um, it's that moment of bringing it to life. Um, and then after that, I'm not, very few pieces uh, am I really attached to. Uh, my family is really good about keying up, uh, like queuing up <laughs> and asking for things they really like um, because a lot of my art's very original and I don't necessarily do the same thing over and over again. Um, so yeah, they're good. Like my brother especially is good at saying, I need that choker. I'm dancing, I have to have a choke. <laughs> um, and some go to museums, some sometimes collectors will purchase pieces. Uh, mostly when people work with me, they pretty much are hands off, stand back, let me, you know, have a dialogue with them or with the space, the exhibit, the planned purpose. And then I'll, you know, sort of incubate some ideas and come up with a design and then you know, ownership is transferred. And, uh, you know, sometimes if I'm lucky, I, I get to visit it again. Um, and sometimes I don't, you know, it just varies a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's, it's that creative act that is most important to me. That's, that's really amazing to hear. That's really special, I think. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm really glad to know to know more about that artistic process. I um I also wanted to know because um I myself am am, am part indigenous Panamanian. I'm from the uh, the Kuna tribe, and so I I kind of drew a connection because like you, a lot of people from the Kuna tribe would um even though they live mostly in the jungle, they would commute to um, Panama City to sell their art, um, which is you know, one of the most um, famous um, famous things about Panama is, is indigenous art. And I, have, I wanted to know- I have one of her baskets. <laughs> sorry. Yeah? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, the grass. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, 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 that's, that's amazing. That's great. I just, um, I wanted to know what you thought about um, the different styles of art. I don't know if you probably, well, if you've seen it because you have the basket, what you thought about other types of indigenous art. And if that is, um, you know, speaking of common ground, if that is like something that 
you can really like identify with even in people that you know might not look like you or may may not speak your language that's an excellent question um yeah so so the story behind my basket i don't have it i had it on the um, dresser next to me but i i moved it actually um it was just a beautiful round shape and it was tightly woven and the colors were very um, rich, deep earth tones. And I liked that there was a little bit of information about earth dyes, like um, the actual clay or soil itself or minerals being used to color the reeds or the grasses that were used. So I immediately, it resonated with me as another creative person using my local indigenous materials um, for an art form that looks different. But um, the idea, I think, for me as an artist who's a native artist who makes a lot of functional art, um, like an eel trap that might also be attractive or a nice corn husk basket, but that you could really put on and use. And it's not offensive to me to think of someone using my art and wearing it out. Um, the beauty of being an artist is you can make another one. So it's not a biggie. Um, there was a functionality and a, an integrity uh, you know, I can tell too, being a weaver, I can always tell when I'm picking something up or looking at it, uh, whether or not it's that person's first attempt. And this was very solid and quite beautiful. And, um, you know, yeah, there's something about the vibe. This was really well made. This is a, an experienced artist. I don't know, but I can sort of picture somebody, you know, sitting down with their aunties or their moms or I'm throwing the matriarchal thing in, but maybe it wasn't matriarchal at all. Maybe that's not appropriate. Um, but I can sort of feel like this is from a this is from someplace distinctive. This is from a tradition. This is valued by somebody, and so it's part of the human connection. I think that I was talking about uh, it was you know it was resonating from that piece, and that's why I came home with it. It was actually the opening of the National Museum of the American Indian down in DC. I went down for the opening with a lot of people from my tribe actually, we got on, we loaded onto two buses and drove down and um, it was so crowded, but I spotted it in the gift shop. And so that's, that's where I got mine. Um, I should probably see the uh, chat and see if there's anything I could um, answer. Let me, I can switch. Um, so Elizabeth, I have a comment. It's more of a comment than a question, but um, Sharon Bernard said that she is reading Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer and that your talk is the perfect compliment um, to the book. She had insightful language about the coexistence of people in the earth and the reciprocity of giving and receiving between people in the natural worlds. It's an excellent book. Thank you. That's nice. And then I know, um, I don't know if Sophia was uh, purposely skipping this to give the floor to others in the chat, but I, I know you uh, mentioned it a couple of times. And I didn't know if you could go a little more in depth about sort of matrilineal, um, you know, families being through mothers. And you mentioned earlier that you think women should be at least on par with men in our discussions of history. But I think um, particularly with a lot of indigenous groups, it's, you know, it's creator and then mother. You know, those are the two important things. Um, so I didn't know if you could expand on that a little bit because I know Sophia really picked up on that in the um, in the panels in your exhibit. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Yeah, so, um, so within Native society, um, I think partly because you're in your mom's womb for more than nine months now, um, you know, they say, uh, you, you sort of form within your mother and you derive all the nutrients that you need in that stage from your mother. And then there's a lot of input from your mom, you know, in an extended family, at least from grandmothers, from aunties, um, from siblings that, that may be sisters um, and cousins and things. It's a kind of a mindful sharing of tradition and family stories and genealogy um, that goes way, way, way back. I mean, I think that in some ways people had to become more careful with their resources 
um, during the whaling days because suddenly men, uh, you know, were literally away for years and some men never came back. Um, and this was before, you know, all of the social, you know, programs that we have now that keep people from, um, from basically starving, essentially that sort of thing. Um, community helps, but people were all raised to be really self-reliant that included women. And so, um, you know, marriage, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a joining of clans, uh, but the man marries into his wife's clan and we're matrilocal. And so when a man back in the day, not necessarily now, uh, married into a family, he would move in with his wife's family or like near his wife's family in her community. So if you were um, Aquina and I'll use an example from my lineage way, way back. Um, there was an Aquina woman in leadership and um, Natoxit from Shawmut from the Mystic River around Boston uh, moved to the island in the 1500s and he married an Aquina woman and one of their children was Mitak. So he was a sachem in, in my community. But if his mother had not been leadership, if he hadn't gotten leadership on the female line, chances are good he wouldn't have actually been a community leader um, because usually, um, you know, your, your mother's extended family helped to raise you in those traditions. If they were already leadership, they already had the network, they were already doing the traveling, they were already working on the multilingual um, responsibilities that you'd have as a community leader, or a regional leader. Um, you know, folks in leadership families sent their kids to other tribes. Um, and it was a way of, of forming social ties and learning about um, other related tribes mostly. And being, um, having a relationship and a friendship and lifelong friendships and associations, it keeps things much more workable and peaceful and reasonable and respectful if everybody sort of grew up together. You know, it's just not um, the same competitive atmosphere as if everybody was all isolated and not talking to each other and not acknowledging and not like, oh yeah, well, you lived in my house when I was growing up. You're not a stranger. This is, this is something we can talk about and figure out pretty quick. Um, and it's gonna benefit us both to do so. And so that a lot of our diplomacy revolved around that. Um, men and women were leaders and um, it's not uncomfortable for like Aquina people to have a female leader, um, to have women be prominent, to have women talking history or genealogy. Um, it's part of our traditions. It's part of our responsibility as women. Um, and so when it's not acknowledged or someone like nowadays, like because it's, six, it's 2020, you know, the anniversary of 1620, people will want to talk about the quote, Pilgrim Fathers. And I really, I struggle with that term because like, okay, you know, there have to be Pilgrim Fathers and Mothers or there would be no Pilgrim descendants. So maybe you wanna change that phrase. I don't know, uh, it's, it's rough. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's part of my identity, I think as a Wampanoag woman to, to collect family stories, to learn as much about the genealogy that we know and to remember it. And I think because my grandma had done that a lot, um, but some of the things had been lost and she got mistrustful actually of noting things down in the notebook. And so she just taught herself to commit everything to memory. And I think just talking to her a lot, I just automatically did this a lot of the same stuff. Um, now I do some writing because I'm not gonna be here forever. Uh, and sometimes when you're piecing together complicated histories that, you know, in the intervening years haven't been written about a lot. Um, there's, it's worth committing to paper and being able to share with other folks. And as I said, there's Wampanoag folks all over. There's a, there's some Wampanoag folks from the Eastern family living in um, Montana. Um, and that I was corresponding with this week, actually, uh, they were sharing some of their family history and I was sharing some of mine. And, you know, we just, it's, it's like, um, it's like meeting by the fireside, but, you know, we, we can't uh, because of a pandemic and because Montana is not down the road. Um, but we all stay in touch. And I think it's those common community values and family values and, um, you know, being raised in similar ways that keeps folks together, even though we're physically separated.
And I just want to let everyone know um, we've got about 10 minutes um, for questions and comments. Um, so I'll give you a couple of seconds to jot those down if you want me to relay anything to Elizabeth. But um, as, as we're waiting for that, I wonder if you can talk about this piece that's on um, this final slide because I think this is exactly what you and Sophia were talking about earlier. You could explain what the piece is and why you made it and, and who it's for, whom it's for. I think um, attendees would get a real sense of what you were talking about earlier. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so this is a piece that is a pretty good size shell pendant um, out of a really thick old shell. So it has um, a really strong presence and it was a really special piece and I kept it for a long time before I did anything with it because it's not every day that you come across a really nice thick shell that's that's as substantial as this one. And so um, in working on the pieces from the exhibit, I started to think about wanting to have some pieces that that paid homage to um, to our traditional beliefs and our traditional not the creator I, so I guess like there's sort of like different beings so there's the creator there's mother earth um, there's thunder beings and, and other elemental beings in nature that keep the world spinning and working and watered and yeah just running um, and then there's land shapers and um, Benevolent giants like Moshop would be one in this particular region. Um, Squant was his companion. Um, Squant was his wife, but she was actually bigger than Moshop uh, because she was a sea goddess and the sea is really vast. Um, but it's that elemental, feminine, uh, water kind of association. And so Moshop was a land shaper and sometimes also associated with ice or glaciers too. Um, so sort of locking up that potential energy and changing things and holding things in a certain way and different way. And so Mashup is credited with creating the island where it had all been part of the mainland, but you know, dragging his foot and causing that channel so that the water rushed in um, and feeding the people with whales that he caught with his hands because he was huge and all of these great stories. They're very visual and striking and they correlate to different um, you know, parts of our landscapes, um, Squants Rock and Sakonet. Uh, or related to stories about his wife and people paid their respects there. The cliffs are strongly associated with Moshop. Um, and so, so I decided to make a piece for Moshop and make a piece for Squant. Um, the piece I made for Moshop, I was being slightly humorous too. So like I spun a ton of Indian hemp, which is dogbane. It's, um, it's in the milkweed family. It's not milkweed per se. It's like a branch form of milkweed uh, with a little slightly different white flower. It's, you know, all over the place in the Northeast. Um, it's a really, really strong fiber. It's naturally tan, so I didn't dye this. This is the natural color. Uh, and I had a lot of it. So I just spun yards and yards and yards, really fine. And then I made this multi-strand, very, very long. It, it's off screen, but I made this just like for somebody with a huge neck, let's just say that. And then I made this huge button bead and a, a loop closure. And so that's that's how it's, Put on. So this is supposed to be Moshup's locket. And, um, you know, it's meant as a gift. Um, it's meant in a humorous way, a little bit. Um, and, you know, also it's meant to, you know, kind of chuckle with my own people and remember traditional things that are important. And, um, you know, I like those, I like those pieces that, that play with scale as an artist, I guess. And so the idea of making things for giants, you know, designing, I've talked at the Children's Museum, I had pitched an idea ages ago about making a huge moccasin and quilling it, you know, like, you know, Masha had just discarded one of his shoes or something. Um, so those, there's sort of these ideas kind of will, will be brewing in the back of my head um, that are to remind us of our ways, um, you know, express our sense of humor, but also just be creative and have a good time doing it. And so that was my, my inspiration behind this piece. It was one of my favorites, even though it's, it's relatively simple. And then the other piece was the multi earrings that I designed for Squant. Um, they're sizable for a larger person, again, a giant. And each one is unique. And I was thinking, well, if Squant has multiple eyes, I don't think it's too far-fetched to say maybe she had like six ears. So I'm gonna make six earrings 
and each one is distinct and kind of has its own little story that goes with it in terms of the designs. There's the shark's tooth. Um, you know, she's a water goddess. That'd be pretty familiar. There's a whale, there's a water panther. And so I went to the sort of the watery side of our traditions and beliefs, the feminine, the creative, um, the regenerative, you know, so there's sort of the, the cycles, I guess, um, in those, in our stories and beliefs, and also just when you live in an area for a long, long time, um, anywhere, I think in the Western hemisphere, if I had to guess about our stories, I would say the, some of our stories have that sort of cyclical nature. And I think um, it's a way of anticipating that things, things are constantly changing, they're constantly developing, they're renewing, things maybe look like they're devastated or destroyed, there's a hurricane, but really it's sort of like a clean slate where new things are coming up and regenerating, maybe growing in a different way, or there's a volcano in a different part of the world, um, or there's an earthquake or, you know, so there's there's some loss and sadness. We're mortals, you know. Um, uh, we're going to feel those effects in different ways than Masha Prasant would, uh, and it's going to cost us sometimes. But I think taking the long view and understanding that some of that is for the good of the earth, some of it is probably for the good of the rest of the beings in creation. Um, I think it it gives you a different perspective. I think on uh, devastation and. You know, I, I like to think because, you know, my tribe survived um, colonization and plagues and um, here we are going through plagues again. Uh, I think people went to their art as real solace and um, expressions of kindness. Um, and I think, I think it's ironic, but I think some, in some ways that suffering it made, it just imbues the art with so much expressiveness. It's really important that I express this. It's really important that I share this right now. Can't take tomorrow for granted. I can't take tomorrow for granted. This is really weird for me. I talked about plagues all the time when I was talking about history um, and I just uh, didn't quite see, um, yeah, I did not see us being in this situation again. And it's, it's kind of disturbing, but you know, I think going back to traditional values, going back to family, um, staying in touch with friends, uh, being creative and experiencing that moment of joy, you know, it might not solve all your problems, but, um, you know, it puts you in touch with the rest of creation uh, and it keeps you, you present and it keeps you grounded. Um, so where I think maybe I wondered about like, how could my ancestors go on doing Beautiful wampum after that you lost half the population. Really? I think I'd be pretty suicidal. But I, when this hit, I found myself thinking, you know what, maybe it'd just be good if I did some quill work. I'm just gonna sit down and think about some designs. And it was really grounding and centering and encouraging. And then pretty soon I had something to share. And then, you know, chatting with my friends about their projects. And um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting coping mechanism. Um, that also serves various other purposes too. But it, maybe, so maybe, I think I would venture to say maybe arts have the potential to be healing. Um, and, and, you know, not simply, not only for like Wampanoag people, um, but for folks from all kinds of cultures. And I think the same you asked about your indigenous arts as well. Yeah, I get that. I mean, I, I think I really appreciate it. Um, when I meet other artists, I really appreciate being able to see them doing their art or having access to pieces that, that they made. Um, it's nice to meet the artist because you can support the artist directly. That you know doesn't always happen. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's that vibe, you know, creativity and the caring and, and the endurance and all those values that comes through. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, and believe it or not, this hour just flew by. We are already out of time. Um, but I, I really do want to thank you again, Elizabeth. And I think everyone who is online with us now has now has the benefit of going into your exhibition with all of this knowledge um, that you've given us. And, and I think that you will see when you go into the exhibit everything that Elizabeth has discussed tonight, though. 
not the specifics. So you'll get a lot about environment, about women, about history, about loss and renewal. Um, it's all in the exhibition of her beautiful wampum pieces. So I definitely encourage you to come and see her exhibition, which will be in place until the end of February, 2021. Um, thank you, Sophia, for being a panelist tonight. It was great to have you know, a team, a young adult, um, participate so masterfully um, and engage with Elizabeth. And I think, um, I know from talking to you about the exhibit previously and you being here tonight, um, it really gives us a good lens on, um, you know, your generation is the one who's gonna have to deal with a lot of the things Elizabeth has discussed tonight. So it's really important um, to include you in the conversation. And I wanna um, once again thank Mass Humanities for their um, partial funding of this presentation and thank the attendees for being here. Um, you're getting some thank yous in the chat, of course, Elizabeth. Thank um, you. And, and I'm sure everyone you know, who hasn't seen your exhibition yet will be in to see it soon. I know Jocelyn has some upcoming events that she wants to highlight before we say good evening to you. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you.